This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's a New Year's resolution or a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their wonderful all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. In the middle of the baking Karakam Desert lies a doorway to another world. The Devaza gas crater is a surreal monstrosity, a gigantic pit filled with flames that just never go out. Sitting alongside the ancient Silk Road, it feels like the sort of place you might meet an evil djinn. Yet its mythical appearance is misleading. The crater only came into being within the last 50 years. The remnants of a Soviet-era attempt to extract gas from Turkmenistan's desert wastes, the pit is said to have been ignited by scientists who assumed that it would burn itself out within a couple of weeks. Instead, it has remained on fire ever since, earning it the spooky nickname, the Gate to Hell. But while the gate to hell is internet famous today, the circumstances surrounding its precise origins are shrouded in mystery. Created under the long shadow of Soviet rule, almost all documents relating to it have been lost or destroyed. Today, Geographics is investigating the tale behind one of the planet's strangest sights and exploring the history of the troubled nation that calls it home. If you're the kind of person who enjoys strange sights, they don't come much stranger than the Devaza gas crater. Located in the featureless nightmare that is Turkmenistan's Karakam Desert, the pit is many kilometers from civilization. The only sign of life, aside from the freakishly huge desert spiders, is the tiny, broken-down village of Davaza, which means the gate in Turkmen. But while the location along the ancient Silk Road is interesting, it has nothing on the pit itself. At 69 meters wide and 30 meters deep, the gas crater dominates its corner of the landscape. Seen by daylight, it looks vast and terrifying, but by night, it becomes an image out of a science fiction film. The walls and floor of the pit are dotted with jets of fire, which, taken all together, have been burning non-stop for decades. At the crater floor, the temperature exceeds 400 degrees Celsius, hot enough to kill almost anything. Because of this intense heat, the air above the pit shimmers. When the wind is blowing, that same heat makes it impossible to look into. There's also the glow. So far from cities and roads, the pit is the only source of light, its flames visible from the far distance. Perhaps it's no wonder the few locals living nearby named it the Gate to Hell. Evocative as that is, though, there's nobody who actually believes this is an entrance to Hades. As its name implies, the Davaza gas crater sits atop a natural gas field, just one of many in a country, with the fourth largest reserves in the world. But exactly what caused this pit to form and what led to it becoming the flaming monstrosity of internet lore is a complex story, one that's tied to the history of Turkmenistan itself. In order to do that story justice and hopefully teach us all a bit about a place we otherwise know nothing about, we're going to go right back to the start. Coincidentally, that's also the start of the long, gruesome story, better known as how Russia and Turkmenistan dicked each other over for 200 years. The area we now call Turkmenistan traditionally had little in common with an actual functioning nation. Its citizens were nomads, with about as much interest in European-style statecraft as you probably have in living in a yurt and dying of dysentery. But that doesn't mean other powers didn't see their land as prime real estate. In the early 19th century, that meant a friendly visit Visit from Imperial Russia. This being the golden age of imperialism, the Russian Empire arrived determined to exploit some resources and civilize some natives. Unfortunately for St. Petersburg, the nomadic Turkmen weren't all that keen on civilization. Over the next few years, expansion into the region was greeted with anti-Russian massacres and the capturing of imperial subjects and selling them into slavery. Finally, in 1869, the Tsar authorized a massive military force to go down and quell the unrest once and for all. The resulting conquest took over a decade, at last ending when General Mikhail Skobolev proved victorious at the Battle of Goktepe. To celebrate, Skobolev had every single adult Turkmen male executed. From then on, Turkmenistan's future as a part of the Russian Empire would be assured. Still, it would be a hell of a bumpy ride. Of all the regions in the world, it's doubtful anywhere reacted to the news of the Russian Revolution with more glee than the province of Turkestan. Ever since General Skobolev had got his slaughter on, the Turkmen had been trying to throw off the Romanov yoke. There had been battles. Massacres. In 1916, Russian settlers in Tien had been slaughtered by the nomads. Yet it would be the February Revolution of 1917 that finally brought the imperial order crashing down. You can almost imagine how delighted the Turkmen must have been. Their hated overlords 
finally destroyed. But you know that phrase, out of the frying pan and into the fire? Well, Turkestan was about to go leaping out of the frying pan and into a gigantic flaming gas crater. The February Revolution was followed just months later by the October Revolution, bringing the Bolsheviks to power. This was in turn followed by the Russian Civil War, in which the Reds and the Whites, along with their foreign allies, dueled for supremacy. For Turkestan, this meant being the epicenter of first a British invasion and then a counter-invasion by the Red Forces that only ended with the 1919 capture of Ashgabat. After that, it was back to being ruled by the Russians, only now they waved red flags and talked about the Brotherhood of Workers instead of the glory of the Tsar. So yes, very much a case from a Turkmen perspective of meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Over the next few years, what is now Turkmenistan was organized into the Turkmen Soviet Socialist Republic public before officially joining the USSR in 1925. But while that overview might make everything sound simple, it was anything but. All the way into 1936, nomadic Turkmen waged a guerrilla war against the Soviets. The Soviets, see, were super keen on everyone living on collective farms, which the nomadic Turkmen considered worse than death. So they fought, and when they lost, over a million of them fled into both Afghanistan and the Karakum Desert, determined to preserve their traditional ways. Sadly, the 20th century would turn out to be a wrecking ball for tradition. As the Soviet presence became more settled in the Turkmen SSR, new projects got underway that dramatically altered the landscape. The first of these was the 1948 Great Plan for the Transformation of Nature. Basically, a fancy way of saying, oh boy, are we going to screw the environment up. The plan involved turning Central Asia's unproductive deserts into a heaven for agriculture. In Turkmenistan, this meant building the colossal Karakum Canal, a 1,100-kilometer behemoth that swept from Amodara across the desert, creating a new fertile land for growing cotton. It was a miracle of engineering, it was also a really stupid thing to do. If you've seen our video on the ecological disaster zone that is the Aral Sea, you know the Karakum Canal was one of the channels that diverted all of its water away. But the canal wouldn't be the only example of a lack of forward planning in Soviet Central Asia. In February 1966, the vast Odzak natural gas field was discovered beneath Turkmenistan. It was the beginning of a mad rush to exploit the Republic's reserves, one that would soon see the SSR crisscrossed with pipeline and Ashgabat turned into a capital flowing with energy wealth. It would also be the beginning of a series of screw-ups that would culminate in a tiny village opening the gates of hell. Now, before we continue on today, just a quick word from our video sponsor, Squarespace. Look, we're coming up on 2021, so whatever that new thing you're thinking about doing is, well, it's time to do it with Squarespace. Squarespace is the platform to use if you want to get started on that web project that you're thinking about. You're looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like. Bam! Use one of their quick and beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you. Well, maybe you're a bit more of a hands-on person, you have lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly your site should look like. Squarespace gives you all the customization options that you could ever want, with no updates, no patches, no tech BS to deal with. And once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides so that your website can thrive. Mailings, social integrations, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support. It's everything you want in one place. And look, this isn't just another advertiser partnership for me. When I launched a website for my Mega Projects channel last year, I went straight to Squarespace and I used their platform to create this elegant, super functional website. It was easy, nothing to it. Megaprojects.net is where you can check that out. And Squarespace made it happen. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's gotta be done with Squarespace. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back to Turkmenistan. When it comes to judging the least exciting phrase imaginable, the history of gas extraction in Turkmenistan would almost certainly make the top five. But not according to the Soviets. In the era of the USSR, gas extraction wasn't just extremely unboring, it was a state secret, as was anything related to energy production. That means everything officially recorded about the Davaza gas crater was written in top secret files. Files Moscow still doesn't open for just anyone 
not even us at Geographics. Hence the exceptionally vague origin story that you are about to hear. In the first years of Turkmenistan's mad gas rush, four more fields were discovered. By the time the 1970s dawned, the race was on to find the fifth. And nobody wanted to be a part of the team that failed because it did too much research or worried too much about health and safety. In 1971, this would yield some explosive results. The most common version of the Devaza gas crater's origin involves a small group of Soviet geologists trekking into the Karakum Desert to do some exploratory drilling. Identifying a likely spot, they set up a rig and got to work, only to discover too late that they were atop a pocket of gas so shallow the ground couldn't support the rig's weight. The rig collapsed, falling into a newly formed sinkhole that only avoided swallowing any of the workers by a miracle. This collapse, in turn, triggered a chain reaction, opening up other sinkholes in the desert. One of these holes would soon fill with water, another would turn into a pit of boiling mud. But it was the initial crater below the rig, just outside of the village of Darvaza, that was the most worrying. It stayed open, spewing out vast quantities of methane. And this was a serious problem. Although methane isn't poisonous, it can displace all the oxygen from an area, suffocating those nearby. More to the point, it's highly flammable. With just a 5% concentration in the air, you can set the grounds for a massive explosion. In cases where the methane keeps seeping out, that can translate to a series of explosions. There was simply no way the geologists could leave their new sinkhole as it was. Luckily, they already had an emergency solution. Flaring is a technique used across the world to burn off excess natural gas. Basically, it's like those fires you see burning atop the towers at the start of Blade Runner. In North Dakota alone, almost a million dollars of excess gas is flared off every single day. So the decision to set the crater on fire, it wasn't particularly unusual. But what happened next was. The scientists dropped in a grenade, thinking the gas would flare off in a few weeks. Instead, it's been burning ever since. Now, this is only the most commonly accepted story for the crater's origin. Other versions, more popular among Turkmen geologists, say the crater was actually formed years earlier in the 1960s and bubbled with mud for two decades before suddenly igniting at the end of the Soviet period. Something that the fire was started by accident, possibly by a lightning strike. Yet others think it was deliberate, but not thanks to worried geologists. A wonderfully persistent local myth has it that a shepherd's sheep asphyxiated after getting too close to the crater's rim. In anger, he then lit a tire on fire and rolled it in, sparking off the inferno that we still see today. Whoever really lit the fire, it was probably the right call, though. While it's not great for the environment having a monster pit spewing out CO2 day and night, it is better than one constantly emitting methane. So at this point, you might be wondering, well, hang on, why are the origins still a mystery? The USSR collapsed decades ago. How come these files have never come to light? To answer that, this video is going to have to take a sharp turn, one that leads not to images of a giant fire pit burning in the desert, but to a country so repressive it could give North Korea a run for its money. It's time we talked about independent Turkmenistan. When wondering why we don't know more about the Devaza gas crater, there's one salient fact you have to bear in mind. In 2019, Reporters Without Borders released their press freedom rankings for the entire world. Turkmenistan finished dead last behind even North Korea. That fact alone should tell you everything you need to know about researching stories on Turkmenistan. The rot started in 1985, the same year Mikhail Gorbachev became leader of the USSR. Gorbachev may have been all about openness and transparency, but he was also all about rooting out corruption. And the Turkmen SSR was corrupt even by communist standards. So Gorbachev removed the current leader and replaced him with Sapomorad Niyazov, an engineer by training. Niyazov was Russian-educated and divorced from Turkmenistan's clan-like circles of corruption. This should have made him the ideal leader, but he was also sadly a die-hard conservative and budding authoritarian. When the USSR under Gorbachev turned a blind eye to the national movement sweeping its republics in the late 1980s, Niyazov turned the screws, stamping out all sign of dissent. When hardline generals launched their coup against Gorbachev in August 1991, he sided with the coup plotters. Finally, when the coup failed and it became obvious the Soviet Union was dissolving, Nazov jumped ship to preserve his power. Turkmenistan declared independence on October 27, 1991. From the get-go, Nazov's post-communist rule was as oppressive as anything that had come before. He rigged elections to keep his role as leader before throwing in the towel in 1999 and declaring himself president for life. At the same time, he instituted a wave of repression and a personality cult that would make Kim Jong-un green with envy. <coughs> First, 
the repression. Under Niazov, Turkmenistan was almost completely cut off from the outside world. Like North Korea, entering or leaving became almost impossible. Special internal passports confined people to their villages and freedom of movement was eliminated. Then came the anti-Russia drive. In the early 2000s, Niazov went after Turkmenistan's Russian minority with a viciousness that was staggering. Ethnic Russians were fired from their jobs and deported. In 2003, those with dual nationality were given three months to renounce their Russian citizenship or have all of their property confiscated. Then, in 2004, ethnic Turkmen who'd been educated in Moscow or St. Petersburg were also fired, a figure that included most of the nation's doctors and teachers. The result was a health and education system that was suddenly in the hands of Niazov loyalists who knew nothing about either. Unsurprisingly, healthcare collapsed. As all of this was happening, a bizarre personality cult was taking root. Nazov was named Turkmen Bashi, or a leader of the Turkmen. A gigantic gold statue of him was constructed in Ashgabat, designed to rotate to always face the sun. Days of the week were named after family members. Anyone passing a state exam, even for a driver's license, was forced to memorize his autobiography. But while this might sound grimly amusing, for Turkmenistan citizens, it was just grim. In the early 2000s, Nazov created a special presidential fund that diverted 50% of the nation's GDP into his pockets. As he got richer and crazier, the Turkmen economy fell to pieces, leaving citizens, and this is really saying something, worse off than they'd been under the USSR. By the time Niazov died of heart failure in 2006, Turkmenistan was one of the most closed off, most repressed, most backwards facing countries on the planet. Sadly, things would only go downhill from there. Imagine if Kim's North Korea and Maduro's Venezuela somehow got together and managed to create a dysfunctional socialist baby. That freaky offspring might look something like Turkmenistan post-2006. <laughs> Following Niazov's unlamented passing, the health minister, and this name is a nightmare, Gubanguli Berdimukhamedov rose to the presidency. Just to make my life easier, I'm going to refer to him as GB. Given he was only health minister and in a country with non-existent healthcare, no one's quite sure how he managed it. But manage it, he did. In 2007, GB became Turkmenistan's official leader. Although he swiftly took an axe to Niazov's personality cult, it was only to replace it with one of his own. There were new gold statues, new places and institutions renamed after relatives. There was even a brand new book people had to study to pass their driving exams. This one was GB's Story of the Turkmen. But the real changes were on the ground in people's homes and villages. GB made sure all information and movement was totally controlled. By the end of the 2010s, only 15% of Turkmen had access to the internet. Of those lucky few, all of them had their online activity closely monitored by the government. VPNs were blocked, and random blackouts were deliberately caused to stop people stumbling across foreign news. Satellite dishes were banned from homes, and a combination of dire poverty and secret travel blacklists made it near impossible for ordinary people to move around the country. But things really went downhill in 2016. That year, gas sales to Russia were suspended, ending what was then pretty much the only thing keeping Turkmenistan's economy afloat. As the financial collapse began to take its toll, GB seems to have looked at the economic chaos gripping Venezuela and declared, well, that looks good, let's do that. Rigid currency controls were brought in, triggering hyperinflation that crippled the country. There were food shortages. Rationing. Imports of essentials collapsed by 80%. Remember all those semi-recent stories from Caracas about even the rich being unable to get hold of basic supplies? Well, it was happening in Turkmenistan at the same exact time, only GB somehow made it even worse. Come 2010, Turkmenistan's unemployment rate was thought to have reached 50%. With news hard to come by, it's impossible to say what the full effects were, but it's been reported that most villages have been reduced to living off subsistence farming. Elsewhere, others were corralled into forced labor by the state, enslaved in a desperate attempt to shore up a collapsing country. Basically, if North Korea didn't exist, modern Turkmenistan would be the crazy, brutal nation the world looked sideways at and thanked God that it didn't live in. And just like North Korea, the only thing propping up this incompetent government is China, with Beijing now replacing Russia to buy 80% of all Turkmenistan's gas exports. But this is a video about the Dovalza gas crater, not a list of the top 10 reasons we should all hate President's stupid name. So what effect did all of this chaos have on the gate to hell? The short answer is, it nearly killed it.
In 2004, Turkmenistan's first president, Niyazov, was flying over the Karakhan Desert when he happened to glance out of the window. Below lay the open moor of the Gate to Hell, and not far away the village of Darvaza, then home to 3,000 people. But rather than be filled with awe at this strange sight or even concern, Niyazov was instead reportedly angered. Gesturing the desolation below, he declared, I don't want to see this next time I fly over. Shortly after, bulldozers arrived in Darvaza. Soldiers gave the villagers an hour to pack their belongings. Then the machines destroyed their village, burying its rubble beneath the sand. The tiny Darvaza village that exists today is said to be nothing but a reminder, sneakily rebuilt several kilometers away by a few of the original inhabitants. That anecdote should give you some idea of how Turkmenistan's leadership has always seen its most famous site. It's a hatred that carried over into GB's reign. In 2010, the new president personally came to visit the Davaz gas crater. There, he decreed that it needed to be filled and the fires stopped. That, of course, was easier said than done. The thing with gigantic raging fire pits that have been burning for decades is that if anybody had the means and money to put them out, they would have done so long ago. The Centralia mine fire in Pennsylvania, for example, has been burning since 1962. And that's in the USA, a country so much richer than Turkmenistan, it's like comparing Monopoly's Mr. Moneybags with a kid who just found a quarter. But then blowing money on mad projects is kind of what Turkmenistan is all about. Over the last decade, the president has spent billions on a fancy airport for his country that almost no one is allowed to fly into or out of. He's also been trying to build an artificial lake in the middle of the desert, because of course he has. So when he decided to fill in the gate to hell, there were real fears that he was just mad enough to go through with the plan. The only thing that saved the crater was the very thing that ruined the rest of the country, economic collapse. In 2018, the government abruptly dropped its plans to fill in the Darvaza gas crater. Although no announcement was made, basic infrastructure even began appearing beside the rim, an acknowledgement that just maybe Ashgabat was looking to replace its gas income with tourist dollars. A year later, the president even released a video of himself doing donuts next to the pit, because that's just what you're allowed to do when you're a mad, crazy dictator. But there's also been a real push from Turkmenistan to make the crater famous in scientific circles. A few years back, a team part-sponsored by National Geographic investigated the floor of the pit for the first time. To their amazement, they found extremophar bacteria living there amid the constant flames and 400 Celsius heat, a sign that life may live in similarly intense environments elsewhere in our solar system. But sadly, this newfound government reverence for the Davaza gas crater hasn't changed anything for ordinary Turkmen. The COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 kicked away the last pillar of the nation's economy. With a massive slowdown in demand from China, gas revenues fell through the floor. The tiny bit of tourist income also collapsed alongside plans to make the gate to hell a world-class site. This being Turkmenistan, the government responded with a preemptive crackdown, disappearing and torturing potential dissidents and slashing already non-existent services to the bone. The result is a country suffering from a major food crisis, with the majority of people living lives of extreme desperation. And all the while, the government in Ashgabat just looks the other way. Our story today, then, has really been two different stories. One about how a Soviet accident created a strange Instagram-ready site, and another about how, even as the Davaza gas crater grew in fame, the country around it became more and more like the hell the crater is supposed to lead to. Usually, when we do these videos on Soviet relics, the ending is the upbeat part. The USSR collapses and the Aral Sea gets a chance to heal, and the awful tales of Cannibal Island at least see the light of day. But where Darvaza is concerned, things are only getting worse. The crater remains, but the lives of those nearby get ever more desperate. We live in an age where awesome photos on social media mean we often look at places without understanding their context, without realizing the sometimes strange, sometimes awful events surrounding them. Hopefully, where Turkmenistan's gate to hell is concerned, this video has gone some way towards remedying that. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Please do support this channel by supporting our fantastic sponsor, Squarespace. And thank you for watching.